I want to give you a little introduction of my own to this wonderful friend of mine, Anita Raghavan. I first met her uh, way back in 1995. I was then with Business India magazine and I'd come to New York and I was looking around for stories to do and I decided to do a story on Indian journalists uh, who were rising in the mainstream business press. And at that time when I was interviewing all the people who'd reached the top positions, someone said to me, hey, you know, there's this uh, reporter you must meet at the Wall Street Journal. Her name is Anita Raghavan. And he described her as that bright kid who's going places. At that time, Anita was uh, reporting on the securities industries, uh, securities industry here. Yeah. And uh, well, she did go places because I met her again in, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago when uh, our paths crossed at Forbes and Anita was appointed the London bureau chief. And now with this book, I can assure you and that Anita is going to go further afield. So, uh, Anita, let's start off. Uh, you know, you've been wanting to write about the, uh, you know, the whole South Asian diaspora. And why did you choose this particular case? What was so compelling to tell that story at this point in time? Well, you know, I, I was fascinated by um, the fact that um, Raj Rajaratnam, this Sri Lankan street fighter, had managed to seduce um, some of the best and brightest of the Indian American community. You had Rajat Gupta, the three-time chairman of McKinsey, Anil Kumar, his protege, uh, who had gone to some of the finest schools in India, the Dune School, IIT Delhi. And I wanted to know what was it that, that Raj had that managed to cast a spell over so many um, of India's um, finest. But don't you think that, uh, you know, in a sense, it, 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 it was not the brightest moment for the community to be telling that story now? It wasn't, but, but, but I, I think through the story, um, you were able to tell the tale of the rise of the community because all the individuals that are involved in this case um, came, you know, post-1965 after U.S. immigration laws were relaxed and did fantastically well in a very short period of time. And so you have the whole trajectory of the community, you know, its, its highs and its lows. Uh, you know, the other thing I just wanted to ask you, I've been meaning to ask you, the title. I just mm -hmm. love the title. So how did you really hone in on that particular title? Well, if I can start by saying we had many titles before this title. Um, yeah. The first title, which is my favorite, was um, Sons of the Morning. And it came from a, a hymn that I loved when I was in boarding school um, because it captured this, this idea of, of the Indians that got, the Indian American elite that got caught up in this case as being the best and the brightest of, of India. <coughs> Um, and um, I guess not everyone knew the hymn from boarding school, and so that was quickly cast aside. And, um, and then we toyed with uh, two kings, um, uh, because Raj, in a way, was the, the king of wealth, um, you know, and, and Rajat was uh, a different sort of king, a king of, of uh, Thought he was a he was strategist from McKinsey. Um, he had a certain ability about him, and um, I, I I don't want to give away any trade secrets, but I think Hachette was selling another book with Two Kings as the title. So so that quickly had to <laughs> to be uh, <laughs> to be cast aside. And um, finally, um, you know, um, we wanted to focus a bit on um, on um, on um, on um, you know what was this book about, um, uh, and and I think we came to came to um, to the idea of the the, we came to the idea of the billionaire's apprentice because because uh, you know Rajat at some point uh, in his career uh, wanted to have what Raj Rajaratnam had. Um, and it was it was the billions. Well, I thought uh, maybe you could read a little bit from your book, and uh, you know that sets the stage for a further discussion. Okay. 
Um, the passage I'm going to read from um, uh, is from the beginning of the book, and it's Rajat Gupta at the start of his life. And uh, it tells you a little bit about Rajat, and it also tells you about his father, um, who was a prominent freedom fighter who spent many, many years in jail. Um, a cousin of Rajat's told me when I was in Calcutta interviewing her in 2011, she said jail was like a house to him. So um, I'm going to start with that. Ever since he was born, Rajat Kumar Gupta was likened to his father. He was as handsome as his father, with the same strikingly chiseled jawline that gave both men a distinguished air, a sense they belonged to a secret world of privilege that went beyond wealth, intellect, or bloodline. In a society where skin color was a defining force, both Rajat and his father Ashwini were fair-skinned, a clear advantage that afforded them a natural superiority. Both were known for their generosity of spirit, an obliging way that over the course of their lives would win them steadfast friends and loyal followers. But beneath the surface, the similarities ended. Unlike his son, Ashwini Kumar Gupta came of age in an occupied country, seemingly fated by his birth in 1908 to live in deference to an imperial power. As a descendant of one of India's oldest bloodlines, Ashwini was also ironically one of the chosen ones. He would be tapped and trained to deny his Indianness and perform like a faux Englishman, all in the service of India's emperor, Her Majesty the King. While he would receive a proper British education like the other esteemed members of his family, Ashwini Kumar Gupta rejected intellectual servitude. On the morning of Thursday, November the 5th, 1964, Ashwini's eldest son, 15-year-old Rajat Kumar Gupta, dressed himself, carefully draping his best white dhoti over his body. Growing up in a close-knit Indian family of four children, two girls and two boys, the youngest born after the family moved to New Delhi in the 1950s, Rajat was accustomed to shouldering responsibility. He and his older sister were always looking after their younger siblings. By economic necessity, his parents were a two-career couple long before it was in vogue. His mother taught at the local Montessori school, and upon his release from prison, Ashwini took up journalism as a means to support himself and his family. His old revolutionary ties to the leaders of a newly free, free India helped him rise. After India's independence, he was dispatched to start the Delhi edition of the Hindustan Standard. He was a frequent visitor to Rashtrapati Bhavan, the official residence of the President of India, and it was well known among the Delhi press corps that the country's first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru called him by his first name. So trusted was Gupta by government ministers that they would often seek his counsel on how to deal with the press. Born as a British subject, Ashwini Gupta, through hard work and sacrifice, became an insider in modern India. Rajat steeled himself and walked into the anteroom of his uncle's Calcutta home at 19C Rajendra Lal Street to say farewell. Shrouded with heaps of roses, marigolds, and fragrant jasmine, his father lay in a coffin. As was customary, the body was washed in purified water and dressed in a white kurta, a loose-fitting shirt, and a white dhoti. When he'd arrived at the hospital the previous day, he was told that his father was dead. But as he stood at the entrance to his father's room, he saw a plastic bag still attached, bubbling with air from his father's last gasps. For a moment, he thought the doc doctors had made a mistake, but the years of struggle and incarceration had taken their toll. At 56, Ashwini Gupta was dead of kidney failure. In the months leading up to his father's death, young Rajat had spent a lot of time with his father, accompanying him on long walks and listening to stories of his time in the freedom movement. He learned that his father had been intentionally exposed to TB in prison, which ultimately cost him the use of one lung. The ragged two-foot-long scar on his back came from his skin being split open over and over again during one particularly brutal interrogation. Yet, in spite of it all, the father he knew was kind and obliging to everyone. He would later recall, he never spoke ill of anybody, and I would have thought he would have had a lot of resentment built into him. But it wasn't true. This attitude was true of most of my father's generation. They were quite extraordinary in terms of simple living and high thinking and not thinking ill of other people. 
This morning, in front of Rajat's uncle's house, a crowd gathered. Neighbors, friends, and admirers descended like pilgrims on a sorrowful journey.